Section two of Toto's Merry Winter by Laura E. Richards. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Jude Summers. Chapter two, part one. The story of Chop Chin and the Golden Dragon. Once upon a time, long ago and long ago, there lived in Peking, which, as you all know, is the chief city of the Chinese Empire, a boy whose name was Chop Chin. He was the son of Lai Chi, a sweeper of the imperial courtyard, whose duty it was to keep the pavement of the courtyard always absolutely clean, in case His Celestial Majesty, the Emperor, should feel inclined to put his celestial and majestic nose out of doors. Chop Chin hoped to become a sweeper also, when he was a little older, but at the time when my story begins, he was only twelve years old, and the law required that all sweepers should have passed their fourteenth year. So Chop Chin helped his mother about the house, for he was a good boy, carried his father's dinner to him, and made himself generally useful. One day Chop Chin entered the courtyard at the usual time, carrying a jar of rice on his head and a melon in one hand. These were for his father's dinner, and setting them down in a shaded corner on the cool white marble pavement, he looked about for his father. But Lai Chi was nowhere to be seen. A group of sweepers stood at the farther end of the courtyard, talking together in a state of wild excitement, with many gestures. One of them drew his hand across his throat rapidly, and they all shuddered. Someone was to be killed, then? Chop Chin wondered what it all meant. Suddenly one of the group caught sight of him, and at once they all fell silent. Two or three, who were friends of his father, began to wring their hands and tear their clothes, and the oldest sweeper of all advanced solemnly toward the boy, holding out both his hands, with palms downward, in a token of sympathy. "'My son,' he said, "'what is man's life but a string of beads, which at one time or another must be broken?' Shall a wise man disquiet himself whether more or fewer beads have passed over the hand? What words are these? cried Chop Chin, alarmed, though he knew not why. Why do you look and speak so strangely, Yao Lei? And where is my father? The old sweeper led the boy to a stone bench and bade him sit down beside him. Thou knowest, he said, that the first duty of us sweepers is to keep the courtyard always as clean as the sky after rain, and as white as the breath of the frost. I know it well, replied the boy. Does not my father wear out two pairs of scrubbing shoes in a month? Scrubbing shoes, Granny, said Toto softly. I don't mean to interrupt, but what are scrubbing shoes? I remember asking the same question at your age, Toto, said the old lady. And my grandmother told me, that the sweepers always wore shoes with very thick soles, in which stiff bristles were fastened, as in a scrubbing brush. It was their custom to dash the water in bucketfuls over the pavement, and then dance violently about, scrubbing with their feet as hard as they could. "'Oh, what fun!' cried Toto. "'Mayn't we try it some day, Granny? I'll fashion four brushes to your feet, Coon, and you can scrub the floor every day.' "'Thank you kindly,' said the raccoon. "'If you can get the brushes on my feet, "'I will pledge myself to dance in them. "'That is certainly fair.' "'He winked slyly at Toto, while the grandmother continued. "'Alas, my son,' said the old man, "'your father will wear out no more scrubbing shoes. "'Listen, this morning, while we were all busily at work, "'it chanced through some evil fate,' that his celestial majesty felt a desire to taste the freshness of the morning air. Unannounced he came, with only the princely parasol holder, the uniquely umbrella opener, and seven boys to hold up his celestial train. You know that your father is slightly deaf. Yes, well, he stood, my good friend Lai Chi, he stood with his back to the palace. He heard not the noise of the opening door and at the very moment when His Celestial Majesty stepped out into the courtyard, Lai Chi cast a great bucketful of ice-cold water backward, with fatal force and precision. Chop Chin shuddered, and hid his face in his hands. Picture to yourself the dreadful scene, continued the ancient sweeper. 
the celestial petticoat of yellow satin damask was drenched. The celestial shoes of chicken skin embroidered in gold were reduced to a pulp. A shriek burst from every mouth. Your unhappy father turned, and seeing what he had done, fell on his face, as did all the rest of us. In silence we waited for the awful voice, which presently said, Princely parasol holder, our feet are wet. The princely parasol holder groaned, and chattered his teeth together to express his anguish. Unique umbrella opener, continued the emperor. Our petticoat is completely saturated. The unique umbrella opener tore his clothes, and shook his hair wildly about his face, with moans of agony. Let this man's head be removed at sunrise tomorrow, concluded his celestial majesty. Then we all, lying on our faces, wept and cried aloud, and besought the celestial mercy for our comrade. We told the emperor of Lai Chi's long and faithful service, of his upright and devout life, of his wife and children, who looked to him for their daily bread. But all was of no avail. He repeated, in dreadful tones, his former words. Our feet are wet. Our petticoat is saturated. Let this man's head be removed at sunrise tomorrow. Then the unique umbrella holder, who is a kindly man, made also intercession for Lai Chi. But now the emperor waxed wroth, and he said, Are our clothes to be changed, or do we stand here all day in wetness because of this dog? We swear that unless the golden dragon himself came down from his altar and beg for this man's life, he shall die. Enough! and with these words he withdrew into the palace. "'So thou seest, my son,' said the old man sadly, "'that all is over with thy poor father. He is now in the prison of the condemned, and to-morrow at sunrise he must die. Go home, boy, and comfort thy poor mother, telling her this sad thing as gently as thou mayest.' Chop Chin arose, kissed the old man's hand in token of gratitude for his kindness, and left the courtyard without a word. His head was in a whirl, and strange thoughts darted through it. He went home, but did not tell his mother of the fate which awaited her husband in the morrow. He could not feel that it was true. It could not be that the next day, all in a moment, his father would cease to live. There must be some way, some way to save him. And then he seemed to hear the dreadful words, Unless the golden dragon himself come down from his altar and beg for this man's life, he shall die. He told his mother, in answer to her anxious questions, that his father meant to pass the night in the courtyard, as he would be wanted very early in the morning, and, as it was a hot day and promised a warm night, the good woman felt no uneasiness, but turned to her pots and pans. But Chop Chin sat on the bench in front of the house, with his head in his hands, thinking deeply. That evening at sunset, a boy was seen walking slowly along the well-paved street which led to the great temple of the Golden Dragon. He was clad in a snow-white tunic falling to his knees. His arms and legs were bare, and his pigtail unbraided and hanging in a crinkly mass below his waist showed that he was bent on some sacred mission. In his hands, raised high above his head, he carried a bronze bowl of curious workmanship. Many people turned to look at the boy, for his face and figure were of singular beauty. He carries the prayers of some great prince, they said, to offer at the shrine of the golden dragon. And indeed, it was at the great bronze gate of the temple that the boy stopped. Poising the bronze bowl gracefully on his head with one hand, with the other he knocked three times on the gate. It opened, and revealed four guards clad in black armor, who stood with glittering pikes crossed, their points towards the boy. "'What seekest thou?' asked the leader. "'In the court of the holy dragon.' Chop Chin, for I need not tell you the boy was he, lowered the bowl from his head, and offered it to the soldier, with a graceful reverence. Tong Ki Ching, he said, sends you greeting 
and a draught of cool wine. He begs your prayers to the holy dragon, that he may recover from his grievous sickness, and prays that I may pass onward to the shrine. The guards bowed low at the name of Tong Ki Cheng, a powerful prince of the empire, who lay sick of a fever in his palace, as all the city knew. Each one in turn took a draught from the deep bowl, and the leader said, Our prayers shall go up without ceasing for Tong Ki Cheng, the noble and great. Pass on, fair youth, and good success go with thee. They lowered their pikes, and Chop Chin passed slowly through the courtyard, paved with black marble, and came to a second gate, which was of shining steel. Here he knocked again, and the gate was opened by four guards, clad in steel from top to toe, and glittering in the evening light. "'What seekest thou?' they asked, "'in the court of the holy dragon?' Chop Chin answered as before. Tong Ki Cheng sends you greeting, and a draught of cool wine. He begs your prayers to the holy dragon that he may recover from his grievous sickness, and prays that I may pass onward to the shrine. The guards drank deeply from the bowl, and their leader replied, Our prayers shall not cease to go up for Tong Ki Cheng. Pass on, and good success go with thee. Onward the boy went, holding the bronze bowl high above his head, he crossed the white marble courtyard, and his heart beat when he came to the third gate, which was of whitest ivory, for he knew that beyond the third courtyard was the temple itself, the house of gold, in which dwelt the mighty dragon, the most sacred idol in all China. He paused a moment, and then, with a steady hand, knocked at the gate. It opened without a sound and there stood four guards in white armor, inlaid with gold. The same questions and answers were repeated. They drank from the bowl, promised their prayers for Tong Ki Cheng, and then bade the boy pass onward to the golden gate, which gleamed at the farther end of the courtyard. "'But see that thou touch not the gate,' said the chief soldier. "'It is the gate of the temple itself, and no profane hand may rest upon it. Speak only.' and the priests will hear and open to thee. Softly, Chop Chin paced across the last court, which was paved with blocks of ivory and silver, laid in cunning patterns. Halting before the gate of gold, he raised the bowl in his hands and said softly, Kaho Yai, Yai Nong Ti, Tong Ki Cheng, Lo Hum Ki Nai. The gates opened, and showed four priests in robes of cloth of gold, with golden censers in hand. "'Rash youth,' said the chief priest, "'by what right or by whose orders comest thou here, to the sacred shrine of the holy dragon?' Chop Chin knelt upon the threshold of the golden gate, and, with bowed head and downcast eyes, held out the bronze bowl. "'By the right of mortal sickness, most holy priest, come I hither,' he said and by order of the noble Tong Ki Ching, he prays thee and thy brethren to drink to his recovery from his grievous malady, and that your prayers may go up with mine at the jeweled shrine itself. The priest drank solemnly from the bowl, and handed it to his assistants, the last of whom drained the last drop of wine. Our prayers shall truly go up for Tong Ki Ching, he said. Give me thy hand, fair youth, and I will lead thee to the jeweled shrine. But first I will cover thine eyes, for none save ourselves, priests of the first order of the Saki Pan, may look upon the face of the holy dragon. So saying, he bound a silk handkerchief firmly over the boy's eyes, and taking his hand, led him slowly forward. Chop Chin's heart was beating so violently that he was half suffocated, he felt the floor suddenly cold, cold beneath his feet, and knew that he was walking on the golden floor of the temple. A few steps farther, the hand of the priest drew him downward, and together with the four priests, he lay prostrate on his face before the shrine of the golden dragon. A great silence followed. The warm, incense-laden air was stirred by no sound, save the breathing of the five suppliants. 
No breeze rustled the heavy satin curtains which shrouded the windows. No hum of insect or song of bird came from the outer world, which was fast settling down into night. Silence. The boy Chopchin lay as still as if he were carved in marble. He held his breath from time to time, and his whole being seemed strained to one effort, that of listening. Did he hear anything? Was the breathing of the four priests changing a little, growing deeper, growing louder? There, and there again. Was that a whisper of prayer, or was it, could it be, the faintest suspicion of a snore? He lay still, waited and listened listened and waited. After a little while there could be no doubt about it. The four men were breathing heavily, slowly, regularly, and one of them rolled out a sonorous, a majestic snore which resounded through the heavy perfumed air of the temple, yet caused no movement among the other three. There could be no doubt about it. The priests were asleep. Then, and not till then, did Chopchin venture to lift his eyes and look upon the awful mystery which was hidden by these golden walls? He trembled. He turned white as the tunic which covered his dusky limbs. But standing erect, he gazed firmly at the golden dragon. From the floor rose a splendid altar of gold, studded thick with precious gems. Rubies, sapphires, and emeralds, set in mystic lines and figures, formed the characters which told the thirty-two names of the world-renowned dragon. And on the top of this glittering pedestal, fifteen feet in the air, stood the idol itself. It was indeed a marvelous thing to look upon. Ten feet long, composed entirely of thin scales of the purest gold, laid over and over each other, and each scale tipped with a diamond. Two magnificent rubies glowed in the eye sockets, and the head was surmounted by a crown of emeralds worth any ordinary kingdom. But the tail, the tail was the wonder of wonders. Millions of delicate gold wires, as fine as silk, waved gracefully from the scaly tip a length of three feet, and each one was tipped with a diamond, a ruby, or an emerald of surpassing beauty and luster. So wonderful was the shimmering light of the stones that the whole tail seemed to sway and curl to and fro, as if some living creature were moving it, and rays of rainbow-colored light darted from it on every side, dazzling the eyes of the beholder. Chop Chin gazed and gazed, hid his eyes and trembled, and gazed again. At last he shook himself together and whispered, My father, my father. Then softly, Surely, he began to climb up the altar, stepping carefully from glittering point to point, holding on here by a projecting ornament of carven amethyst, there by a block of jasper or onyx. He reached the top, then steadying himself, he leaned forward and lifted the holy dragon from its stand. To his amazement, instead of being barely able to move it, he found he could easily carry it for the gold plates which formed it were so delicate that the weight of the whole great creature was incredibly small. Lightly the boy lifted it in his arms, and slowly, surely, noiselessly, bore it to the ground. Here he paused, and looked keenly at the sleeping priests. Did that one's eyelids quiver? Did his mouth twitch, as if he were waking from his sleep? Was that a movement of yon other man's arm, as if he was stealthily preparing to rise, to spring upon the sacrilegious robber? No, it was but the play of the colored light on the faces and raiment of the sleepers. The voice of their snoring still went on, calmly, evenly, regularly. The wine had done its work well. Then Chopchin took off the sash which bound his tunic at the waist, and shook out its folds. It was a web of crimson silk, so fine and soft that it could be drawn through a finger-ring, and yet, when spread out, so ample that the boy found no difficulty in completely covering his formidable prize. Thus enwrapped, he bore the golden dragon swiftly from the temple, closing the doors of gold softly behind him. 
he crossed the ivory and silver pavement of the inner court, and came to the ivory gate. It was closed, and beside it lay the four white-clad warriors, sunk in profound slumber. Stepping lightly over their prostrate forms, Chop Chin opened the gate softly, and found himself in the second court. This also he traversed safely, finding the armed guards of the steel gate also sleeping soundly, with their mouths wide open, and their shining spears pointing valiantly at nothing. A touch upon the glittering gate, it opened, and Chop Chin began to breathe more freely when he saw the bronze gates of the outer courtyard, and knew that in another minute, if all went well, he would be in the open street. But alas, the four guards clad in black armor, who kept watch by the outer gate, had been the first to drink the drugged wine, and already the effect of the powerful narcotic which it contained had begun to wear off. As Chop Chin, bearing in his arms the shrouded figure of the mighty idol, approached the gate, one of the four sleepers stirred, yawned, rubbed his eyes, and looked about him. It was quite dark, but his eye caught the faint glimmer of the boy's white robe, and seizing his pike he exclaimed, "'Who goes there?' End of chapter 2, part 1